The Constitution of India is the longest written constitution of any sovereign country in the world. Additionally, it emphasizes the importance of constitutional fundamental duties, assuring its citizens justice, equality and liberty and promoting fraternity. In contrast to many others who had become independent at the same time, the Indian constitution has stood the test of time. Hello and welcome viewers. You're watching The Amendments with your host, Kruti Mishra. Today, we'll take a closer look at the Constitution, Fourth Amendment Act of 1955. So come along. The Constituent Assembly of India sat for the first time on December 9, 1946, focusing on deliberations on specific features or segments which led to the adoption of constitution and a democratic republic. The rule of law is the bedrock of democracy and is the basic feature of the constitution which cannot be altered or amended. It is the role of all the organs of state to ensure that democracy is inclusive and that there is accountability since India opted for a parliamentary form of democracy where every section is involved in policy making and decision making. The concept of accountability in any republican democracy while exercising public power has to be taken into consideration. The aim of all the constitutional deliberations in India was to ensure equitable and participative development, which was the need of the hour in the Indian social, economic and political milieu. The opening and the last sentences of the preamble, we, the people, adopt, enact and give to ourselves this constitution, signifies the power is ultimately vested in the hands of the people. Parliament is the supreme legislative body of India, which reflects the will of the people. As in other parliamentary democracies, the Parliament of India has the cardinal functions of legislations, overseeing of administration, passing of the budget, ventilation of public grievances and discussing various subjects like development plans, national policies and international relations. Article 368 of the Constitution deals with the power of Parliament to amend the Constitution and its procedures. It states that Parliament may amend the Constitution by way of addition, variation or repeal of any provision in accordance with the procedure laid down for the purpose. It provides for two types of amendments, that is, by a special majority of Parliament and the special majority of Parliament, along with the ratification of half of the state's legislatures by a simple majority. Under Article 368 2, Parliament can amend the Constitution by passing a bill with a simple majority. An amendment of the Constitution can be initiated only by the introduction of a bill for the purpose in either House of Parliament, Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha, and not in the state legislatures. The bill can be introduced either by a minister or by a private member and does not require prior permission of the President. Each House must pass a bill separately. The President must give assent to the bill. After the President's assent, the bill becomes an act, that is, a Constitutional Amendment Act, and the Constitution stands amended in accordance with the terms of the Act. The Constitution Fourth Amendment Act of 1955 amended Articles 31, 31A and 305 and also the Ninth Schedule to the Constitution. The landmark decisions of the Supreme Court of India gave a wide meaning to Clauses 1 and 2 of Article 31. The deprivation of property in Clause 1 was to be inferred in the widest sense in order to be valid according to the decisions provision for compensation under Clause 2 of the article was the intention. In Kameshwar Singh versus State of Bihar, the Bihar Land Reforms Act of 1950 was held invalid under the Article 14, for it classified the zamindars in discriminatory manner for the purpose of compensation. The central government added into the constitution a new provision, Article 31A, providing for the acquisition by the state of any estate or for any rights therein, or for extinguishing or modifying any such rights. No law would be void on the ground of any inconsistency with any of the fundamental rights contained in the Articles 14, 19 and 31.
the constitution fourth amendment act 1955 was passed by the parliament to amend article 31 31 a 305 and the ninth schedule of the constitution after the enactment of the constitution the government came out with program of social welfare legislations to give effect to part 4 of the constitution and legislations including zamindari abolition laws were passed these laws were being challenged in courts mainly on the ground of violation of fundamental rights under article 14 19 and 31 of the constitution to overcome such challenge, Parliament enacted the Constitution First Amendment Act of 1951 and added Article 31A and 31B and also 9th Schedule in the Constitution. Article 31A dealt with savings of laws, providing for acquisition of a state, and Article 31B validated certain acts and regulations by putting the legislations in the ninth schedule of the constitution. The Constitution Fourth Amendment Act of 1955 made the scale of compensation given in lieu of compulsory acquisition of private property beyond the scrutiny of courts, authorized the state to nationalize any trade, included some more acts in the ninth schedule and extended the scope of Article 31A. While the abolition of zamindari system and the numerous intermediaries between the state and the tiller of the soil was achieved for the most parts of the country, the next objectives in land reform were fixing of limits to the extent of agricultural land that may be owned or occupied by any person, the disposal of any land held in excess of the prescribed maximum limit, and the further modification of the rights of land owners and tenants in agricultural holdings. The proper planning of urban and rural areas required the beneficial utilization of vacant and vast lands and the clearance of slum areas. Under the Article 31 of the Indian Constitution, the right to property has been provided. After the India's independence, there were a number of judgments by the Honorable Supreme Court that reaffirmed this right and because of which various land reforms after the abolition of the zamindari system and for using the land for various public interest and public purposes could not be done. Therefore, there was a need to bring about an amendment in the constitution which would specifically look at Article 31 and several other articles and sections which are relevant to it. And therefore, the constitution's fourth amendment was brought about, which ensured that the right to property to an individual and a citizen of this nation was provided, was guaranteed for, but under specific exceptions. And therefore, specific amendments were made in Article 31 and various other articles in order to ensure that the state could compulsorily acquire property of the private individuals of the nation for a public purpose. And the state could also provide and uh, define a specific compensation which would be justified and appropriate enough for this compulsory acquisition of property by the state. This was done to ensure that while individuals continued to having their rights as citizens to right to property, the state would also have the leverage to compulsorily acquire such properties for the larger good and the larger interest of the nation, various times or various activities, there is a need to acquire property of private individuals. We know there are various public works and uh, developmental activities for which is required. But if this fourth amendment was not brought about in the Indian constitution, the state would not have been in a position to bring about and compulsorily acquire private property, which would have limited its scope for ensuring development for all in the larger interest of the state and society.
In the interest of the national economy, the state should have full control over the mineral and oil resources of the country, including in particular the power to cancel or modify the terms and conditions of prospecting licenses, mining leases and similar agreements. This is also necessary in relation to public utility undertakings which supply power, light or water to the public under licenses granted by the state. It is often necessary to take over under state management for a temporary period a commercial or industrial undertaking or other property in public interests or in order to secure the better management of the undertaking or property. Laws providing for such temporary transference to state management should be permissible under the Constitution. The government felt that if the objective as enshrined in the preamble of the Constitution with regard to justice, social, economic and political and of equality is to be implemented, it is necessary that some of the trades should be nationalized and run by the state only. In the case of Sagir Ahmed versus state of UP, a question arose whether an act providing for a state monopoly in a trade or business conflict with the freedom of trade and commerce as provided by Article 301 of the Constitution. Since provision was being made for creating a state monopoly in a particular sphere of trade and commerce, it was felt necessary that any question about such acquisition being in public interest should remain within the power of the legislature. Therefore, Article 305 of the Constitution was also amended by the Fourth Amendment. For the benefit of the viewers, let me tell that Article 31, which was amended by the Fourth Amendment, has since been repealed by the Constitution 24th Amendment Act in 1977. The Constitution First Amendment Act of 1951 added the Ninth Schedule to Indian Constitution. Laws contained in this Ninth Schedule are immune from judicial review. The Ninth Schedule was created by insertion of Articles 31A and 31B. Article 31A was inserted by the government in order to protect laws related to agrarian reforms and for abolishing the zamindari system. Article 31B of the Constitution of India provided that any law in the Ninth Schedule could not be challenged in the courts. In the Ninth Schedule to the Constitution after Entry 13, the entries added were The Bihar Displaced Persons Rehabilitation Acquisition of Land Act, 1950 the United Provinces Land Acquisition Rehabilitation of Refugees Act 1948 The Resettlement of Displaced Persons Land Acquisition Act of 1948 Sections 52A 52G of the Insurance Act 1938 as inserted by Section 42 of Insurance Amendment Act 1950 The Railway Companies Emergency Provisions Act 1951 Chapter 3A of the Industries Development and Regulation Act of 1951 as inserted by Section 13 of the Industries Development and Regulation Amendment Act of 1953 The West Bengal Land Development and Planning Act of 1948 Many of the laws that were brought about, especially in the Fourth uh, Amendment of the Indian Constitution, were also inserted in the Ninth Schedule to ensure that these laws, which basically dealt with acquisition of compulsorily acquisition of property, were actually beyond the scrutiny of the Indian courts. So that under the specific articles of 14, 19 and 21, the citizens could not challenge them and thereby demand that the compulsory acquisition of rights of uh, property by the state should be stopped. The constitution lays down the structure and defines and delimits and demarcates the role and functions of every organ of the state, including the judiciary and establishes norms for their interrelationships, checks and balances. The doctrine of separation of power implies 
that each pillar of democracy, the executive, legislature and judiciary, perform separate functions and act as separate entities. As a community of persons permanently occupying a definite territory, legally independent of external control, and possessing an organized government, which will create and administer law over all persons and group within its jurisdiction, is called a state. Efficient and effective governance is the expectation of every civilized society. This role is performed by the government, which is one of the four essential elements of the state, along with population, sovereignty and territory. No state is possible without a government which not only provides security to the people, but also looks after their basic needs and ensures their socio-economic development. The makers of the Indian Constitution wanted to ensure that government would be sensitive to public expectations and would be responsible and accountable. The other alternative to the parliamentary executive was the presidential form of government. But the presidential executive puts much emphasis on the president as the chief executive and a source of all executive power. There is always a danger of personality cult in presidential executive positions. The makers of Indian constitution wanted a government that would have a strong executive branch, but at the same time, enough safeguards should be there to check against personality cult. In the parliamentary form, there are many mechanisms that ensure that the executive will be answerable to and controlled by the legislature or people's representatives. So the constitution adopted the parliamentary system of executive for the governments, both at the national and state levels. For articulating the aspirations of the people, there are three organs of the government. The legislature, which makes the law, the executive, which implements them, and the judiciary, which interprets laws and decides disputes. The organs of the government are very structured. They can adequately perform functions required of them. In one of his speeches to the Constituent Assembly, Dr. Ambedkar, while underlining the importance of constitutional morality, emphasized that the essence of constitutional morality was to regard the constitution as supreme and to follow the constitutionally mandated procedures regardless of any difference. All the three organs of the state, persons, gracing the constitutional posts, members of the civil society, common citizens of India are expected to abide by constitutional morality. Well, viewers, that's all we had for you in this edition. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Sunset TV. Goodbye for now from my side.